Okay, good morning and welcome to our May learning series seminar. Uh, as uh, you might have just heard, this session is being recorded and will be made available on our uh, YouTube channel, the Reynolds Company's YouTube channel, for you to watch later or share with uh, any colleagues. Um, today's topic is going to be networking topologies, resiliency, and best practices. Uh, that's uh, quite a lot to try to cover here but uh, we will get it done. Um, so our presenters today joining me will be Mike Masterson and Brian McKeska. Uh, both are automation specialists in our Houston branch and myself, Wayne Welk, automation specialist in New Orleans. The three of us will kind of cover today's content. But first, as we traditionally do, kind of talk about what's coming up and kind of what we've done so far this year. So this was our schedule for the first half of the year. Uh, we will be filling out the second half schedule soon now that we're entering uh, summertime and we'll get those topics uh, defined. But um, in the gray boxes are the things we've done. Those have all been archived and posted on our YouTube channel. So if you've missed one of those sessions, want to go back and watch them, we invite you to, to go do that. Uh, coming up uh, next week, will be our tech talk and our tech talk is usually the shorter session about 30 minutes and we'll have our uh, our guest speaker will be panduit and they will uh, present cable cleats for short circuit protection so that's a little bit of a um, not necessarily an automation topic but uh, around power and uh and short circuit protection and uh, um, uh, racing for for power cables especially in uh, in raceways or, or um the uh, Trey, I should try to say. Um, and then in June, uh, our learning series will be on uh, configuration tools and product selection tools from Rockwell Automation. So that'll be things like Proposal Works and Integrated Architecture Builder. Uh, we'll tease a little bit of that today in our session, but we'll really save the the meat of that for, for June to talk about IAB, especially when it comes to Ethernet uh, configuration and sizing. And then in uh, June for our Tech Talk, uh, Southwire will be our guest, and they will talk about VFT cables, um, if they're essential or overkill. The other thing we've been talking about over the last few months, if you've joined any of our previous sessions, is Automation Fair uh, 2023. This year it'll be in Boston, and it'll be in November, between uh, November 6th and the 9th. What makes it different this year is that it's an extended week. Uh, it'll be a four-day week. The expo will still be two days. It'll still be the Wednesday and the Thursday, which is the traditional dates. This year, it'll be just two days. I think in the future, they intend on expanding the expo to, to, to be for additional days. Um, but what we'll also have is the first two days of the week, uh, Monday, Tuesday, uh, will be um, technical sessions and advanced training. And those will also continue through Thursday. So all four days will be sessions and advanced training, as well as some keynote addresses uh, Tuesday through Thursday. So extending the week, making it a little more um, impactful uh, with more sessions and more advanced training options available to you. So um, registration is going to probably open sometime uh, towards the end of the summer, I would imagine. So just continue to uh, keep up with us and we will share all the information about automation fair as it gets closer. So our agenda today is going to be just um, you know kind of a few few high level topics on on the uh, on networking as we discussed uh, from the title. So we'll start off with a little bit of just re review on converged point wide Ethernet or the CPWE. Then we'll talk about network segmentation, network topologies. Uh, then we'll get into the, the resiliency topics around device level ring, parallel redundancy protocol. And then we'll kind of wrap it up with some network tools that are available. So I'll kick it off with the CPWE, and then I'll turn it over to Mike um, and Brian to uh, to finish out the presentation after that. So let's talk about uh, Converge Plant-Wide Ethernet, or CPWE. Uh, first, just a quick overview of the Stratix portfolio and where it stands today. Um, the big news, if, if you haven't heard, is that the 5700 Stratix 5700 switch is going to is at end of life or, or has been announced at end of life date has been announced. It's still got about a year left in it, so it's it's not um, it's not an immediate um, end of life, but it will be within the next year. Uh, it'll go away. But 
this summer, the Stratex 5200 family will get released. So the 5200 series will be the direct replacements for the 5700. So there will be no gap in, um, in anything here. Uh, it's pretty much going to be a one-to-one -one type replacement from a 5700 to the 5200. So again, these will be coming out very soon, uh, somewhere towards the end of summertime. So uh, as we get uh, closer to the launch, we will, of course, share more information on that. But to run out the portfolio, uh, you know, the Stratix line covers everything from an unmanaged Stratix 2000 switch to the lightly managed 2500 switch, and then up into the higher performing switches like the 5400, 5800, and then the distribution uh, 5410 distribution level switch, which is rack mount. We've done many topics on Stratix switches in the past. Uh, if there's any questions on the portfolio in general and their capabilities, as well as the new 5200 switch. As always, we invite you to contact your local um, sales representative or specialist from the Reynolds company uh, or Midcoast, and we're more than happy to assist in uh, uh, getting you more information. So the benefits of Stratix, you know, this Stratix line has been out for quite some time, and the benefits have been um, discussed many times before, but as a, as a good refresher and anyone who's kind of new to the Rockwell world, um, you know, the, the Stratix switch has some benefits to it, uh, especially when you're coupling it with Rockwell hardware, such as the control logics or compact logics. And mainly is the, uh, the custom add-on profiles and, and add-on instructions that provide the premier integration, um, you know, in, into the logics family of controllers and in the Studio 5000. They do support, uh, several of the switches do support device level ring, uh, capability or DLR. Uh, so, you know, a DLR, as we'll discuss here in a little bit, uh, you do have to have a, you know, a, a switch or a device that is DLR kind of certified, shall we say, to support DLR protocol. And the Stratix, you know, several of the Stratix switches do support DLR. Um, the other thing is the faceplates. A lot of times um, may not be known is that there are some pre-built HMI faceplates for both USC and the panel views, both the uh, the panel view seven and the five thousand series of panel views, so that gives you um, you know again pre built face plates that kind of tie back into those add on instructions to give you visualization into your switch status. Um, under operate, uh, some of the benef you know main benefits is uh, easy to easy deployment or recovery with the secure digital card, so you can store your configuration on a uh, SD card and then um, and then configure a new switch out the box. Uh, there is a DLR specific faceplate. So again, back in the faceplates, there's one, you know, it shows that builds a DLR ring for you and uh, and shows you the health of the of the switch or, or of the ring, sorry, as well as other uh, switch specific faceplates that are, um, you know, again, like if it's a 5400, then it's a faceplate that'll be custom fit for that switch versus a 5700 or the new 5200. And then under maintain, uh, auto device configuration and replace capabilities, making it easy to uh, replace a unit. Um, some other benefits are that they are included in the Tech Connect agreements and uh, updated firmware at no cost. So um, definitely a benefit. So into into the uh, CPWE or con converge plant wide Ethernet. So the CPWE has been around for quite some time. It's I think maybe the first um, document was around a 2011 timeframe. So it's got about 10 years under, you know, a little bit over 10 years under its belt. And and we've been talking about CPWE, you know, f f throughout those last 10 years. Um, basically, the uh, the converged plant wide Ethernet. It's a blueprint that helps you design and deploy your industrial uh, network infrastructure. And it, that, that infrastructure is scalable and reliable and secure. Uh, it, it is a collaboration between Cisco and um, Rockwell Automation. And I think Cisco uh, has their uh, ethernet to the factory uh, guidelines, and then Ro uh, Rockwell had its integrated architecture, and the two kind of uh, came together to to lay out the uh, CPWE. 
And essentially what this all boils down to is that, you know, these are um, tested and characterized uh, ways to go about, you know, designing and imp implementing your industrial uh, network. So Cisco, Rockwell, they've both built the test labs, they've characterized everything, and then, then they documented that in these design and implementation guides, or DIGs as they call them. So on Rockwell's website, as well as on Cisco's website, there are, you know, these design and imp implementation guides that have been uh, created and published and shared so that you can uh, pull them down and read them and use them as your um, kind of your guidelines on how to go about uh, building this in your industrial uh, network structures. And we kind of teased the, you know, next next month's learning series on IAB or Integrated Architecture Builder. And, you know, those guidelines for the CPWE are built into IAB and you can design your, your um, you can design your network around that. So we'll show that next month in more detail. So the key tenets of CPWE are, um, you know, smart industrial IoT devices. So, you know, the, the IoT technology is hardened and it's been ODVA conformance tested, uh, managed infrastructure. So again, using leveraging the stratic switches that we just sh sh showed a few slides ago, um, you know, using that managed infrastructure and then it's tight integration into our logics controllers. Um, so things like the VLANs and resiliency, security and diagnostics, um, those are all part of that man managed uh, infrastructure. Uh, network segmentation, that's something that Mike's going to talk about here in just a few moments. Um, you know, logical and physical segmentation capabilities. Um, level two, level three switching, again, VLANs and firewalls and software defined security groups. Uh, resiliency, so that's another topic uh, that we'll discuss here in just a short bit. Um, you know, with a physical layer, uh, redundant paths. Um, with resiliency protocols, uh, do you, you know, we said we already mentioned DLR a few times here, so that's definitely one of those resiliency protocols, and the ability to do redundant switches, wire, uh, wireless, and firewalls. So, um, so the, the 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 CPWE and the and those design imp implementation guides all have um, you know various um, different uh, digs around uh, building a resilient uh, plant wide network. Time critical data, such as a uh, quality of service and time sync through IEEE's uh, PTP and SIP sync, uh, as well as some guidelines for wireless and mobility. So, uh, you know, be able to kind of use your, uh, you know, extend your network uh, wirelessly in your plant. Um, holistic defense and depth security, as well as uh, convergence ready. So, uh, with network address translation or NAT. So those are the kind of key tenets. Uh, again, there are numerous design implementation guides in the CPWE that touch on um, each one of these in more detail. So there's one kind of giant overall, and then there's several smaller uh, guidelines uh, that are been published to kind of break each one of these topics down in, in more detail. So we invite you to, uh, again, reach out to us um, to, uh, to learn more and we can share uh, all the information with you. So uh, with that, I'm going to now turn it over to Mike, who will pick up on network segmentation. Let me unmute myself. That might be a little bit better. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, network segmentation, topology, and the device level ring. Um, network segmentation is the most important thing I, I tell customers when laying out a network. When I, I, I've been with Reynolds for 20 plus years, and um, when I first started off using Ethernet um, for control networks, the typical application was if you put in unmanaged switches and if you had an open port, you plugged into it and everything worked. Well, that's fine on individual items islands of automation, but not so much in the real world these days. Um, we, we need to segment our networks nowadays. Um, I will say 
more than likely, uh, most of the systems I put out today it, on, on the Logix controllers and stuff um, almost always have at least two networks connected to them. And um, we'll go and talk a little bit why. Um, first of all, the biggest benefit is um, the, the data the, that the controller needs is sitting on the that control network or IO traffic is sitting on its own network. There's nothing else interfering with it. We don't have any um, um, HMI software or any other traffic on the network that is conflicting with our IO traffic, which we consider the most important. Um, so whenever using remote IO for our networks, I always recommend segmenting and putting it on its own network. Now, traditionally in a control logic, when we have this, we typically will use two um, EN2Ts or EN2TRs for the connection, one for the upstream plant level network and one for the control network. This is a typical application we use. Now, this didn't really translate well to the original 1769 compact logic because we only had access to one port on um, for the ethernet well now the 5380 compact logics has two ports that does allow us to split them into two different networks um another reason we want to segment the networks is who owns the network because all, all of our customers are different uh, on how they approach these things but a lot of times it's the i and e guys might be in charge of the um the uh io network or the control network and in a lot of cases, it's the the tip of your typical enterprise IT guys who are working on the plant le network level. Now that's changing. We are having more pe specialized people, uh, networking people involved, but that's what we see a lot of times. Um, so um, one of the benefits, as you see on the segmentation, if you use the two NIC method, um, you have a clear line of demarcation: what's going to the plant network and what's the control network. Now, the, there are some limitations on because we are traveling, the, moving data across the backplane of the control logics then. So it does limit us to some of the control uh, or some of the access from the plant-wide network to the IO devices, which is a lot of times we want that uh, kind, of, kind of restriction. Now, that's using a actual controller for the segmentation, but nowadays we're seeing a lot more of the confer converged segmentation, which means we're putting a lot of more active devices like switches down um, on the uh, at the plant level and using VLANs and then using a healing algorithm like DLR or RSTP or something else for the connection to the upstream network. Um, by doing that, it gives us a lot of flexibility because by using VLANs, we can actually sort of wrangle in the traffic to where it needs to be. Um, it makes uh, the networks a lot more efficiently. The, the problem with this is that does this does require some switch configuration, which traditionally our OT guys have not wanted to do. They're, you know, a lot of them have been used to using unmanaged switches or switches with minimal setup. Well, to, to get the type of integration we need these days, we're doing a uh, setting up a lot more VLANs. Um, Wayne, you wanna go to the next one? Here, where we're looking at the two different segmentation methods. Again, this is not much different than the other slide, but what we're showing here is the 5380 actually has the ability to uh, split the two ethernet ports it has into two separate IP addresses. The original 1769 actually was only one IP address, and even with the two ports, it was still there just to support the device level ring and then give us that capability. So for all new applications, I almost always uh, promote the uh, 5380 over the older compact logic system. It gives you a lot more flexibility in your networks. Um, let's see, Wayne, let's go to the next slide. Now, typical segmentation is um, what you're looking here. This is sort of uh, some. This is a smaller design of what Wayne showed in his uh, one of his slides for his CPWE drawing. This is typically how we see things coming into uh, plants these days. 
we have individual skids or islands of automation coming in and they can all have different type of networks but you'll notice in each situation here we're using vlans to actually control the traffic on this network and we're able to use a mixture of in this case we're using a linear network and a ring network and using the stratix 5400 has the traffic caught between the two directing the the traffic between the two vlans um it gives us a lot more efficiency doing this way but again it does require you to do some switch setup which a lot of people haven't done um, i will say in the stratic setup we do uh, you don't have to be a command line interface expert you can use gui interfaces to do all this configuration and again this is just showing how we might use our stratix 5400 or in this case i think that might be a stratix 5800 to um, set up our VLANs and um, be the traffic cop for our different areas of automation. Here we have a pass server, our, our plant-wide HMI system. And then you'll also notice that we have individual um, VLANs created for our controller, our drives, and an HMI. Again, this is helping us set up the traffic patterns of the data. Um, that, that way we can say, well, the network might be non-deterministic, but we have created efficient networks that get data from point A to point B. All right. Now we're going to talk just in general, just about some different network topologies. So um, basically what we see a lot in the field is a simple star network. This is what we have originally have seen before, um, usually a centralized switch with uh, the devices just hanging off the different ports of the switch. Um, again, this was a great island of automation. The thing is, there is no redundancy on the network. Um, the linear network, which is really just daisy chaining the devices together, um, that has a lot of applications. Uh, again, no redundancy at all. Um, any break could take something down, but it does make itself, it works really well in something like an assembly line or maybe a safety network where you might have e-stops and pull ropes um, on it. So it, it fits that. And then we have the ring network. This gives you simple um, healing and um, it's done multiple different ways. Uh, typically, uh, being um, a Rockwell house, we like to use the vice level ring. But rings also out there, there's rapid spanning tree, uh, Cisco's resilient ether, Ethernet protocol, um, MSRTP. There's lots of ring topologies. Uh, they all operate a little bit different and have different rules. And I'll go into detail why we like to use DLR for our control network shortly. So um, just, just to show you that I have done some research on it, if anyone can tell me what an IACS deployment is, that actually is a wonderful acronym for Industrial Automation and Control System. I actually had to look it up. Um, I, I, if I see Rockwell use it more than five times, I feel obligated I need to have to go look up the, the definition of the acronym. But what we're showing here is a um, typical facility with three different types of networks on it. We have a linear network, a ring network, and a star network. Um, each of those different networks would be typically in their own little zone of automation, or I, I like to use the word island of automation, all connected by a static switch, usually something that has more smarts in it, like maybe a 5400 that can't has different, has some additional capability than our typical 5700 or 5200 because here we might need a switch to do be able to hand that type of switch we might want to handle multiple rings um which in that case uh the stratix 5400 has those capabilities where the 5700 might not and this is bringing back the cpwe diagram of um, a, a typical automation system. Um, when we lay out DCSs, uh, quite often our networks look just like that, this. Um, on the left side, we have a parallel redundancy network, which is basically taking an A and B network to a single device. That is giving us our highest level of redundancy. 
the center part is a ring and actually it's showing different multiple ring topologies. We're showing a device level ring in the center and then the uh, Cisco resilient ethernet protocol in the outer ring. Now they both serve their purposes and I'll go in a little bit in my next section about what's special about DLR, but a lot of times there are rules to them. REP is something we typically would not use for a control network, but we would use it to connect our, our uh, switches together. Uh, uh, but because it's not as high speed as a DLR, we don't typically use it on the control network because we need a faster healing time. And then on the left, on the uh, right side, we have the dual counter rotating rings, which is using some of the higher level ring topology um, like uh, there might be HSRP or Ether channel to create this redundant star type network. So again, all this stuff is doable and all this is covered in the CPWE design guide. I do recommend everyone download it and, and review it when you get a chance. Okay, and now we're just gonna take a look at um, what's different about networks. A redundant network um, and we're showing you here is a PRP network always gives you has zero recovery time. Something's always transmitting. Um, in the case of PRP, what is happening, we have a LAN A and a LAN B and uh, they both will transmit out of both ports and whichever data gets there first is the data that is used. The other port, the other data is thrown out. So we that means we constantly have a hot network up, which is, you know, the the best form of redundancy we have. Now with a ring, typically uh, we we don't have individual um, uh, and one individual failure can break a link on the network. Typically, any of our ring networks is actually if underneath. The uh, hood is a linear network. It is uh, actually point A to point Z. Um, the way a ring will work, it will t send a health packet out every so often and make sure it can get to from A to Z. If it doesn't, it knows there's a break in the network and it will shut down ports and reroute the other direction. A very simple way of doing this. And it's also one of the most cost effective ways to get us um, an extra level of redundancy or resilience, actually. Let me put it that way, because we, we don't want to say it's redundant, but it will give us a network that will be up almost all the time. Um, now, there, and like I said, there are different topologies, I mean, different uh, protocols used to create these networks, but our standard is DLR, which I think I'm about getting ready to talk to. All right, device level ring. It's a single fault tolerant ring um, intended uh, for connection of automation devices. That's what it's there for. It, we don't really use it to connect different island, on, islands of automation. We can use it, but that's not how typically how we will use it in this case. Um, why it works well for this is we build DLR directly into our device, a lot of our devices like our panel views, our IO controllers, our PowerFlex drives, they all have the ability to support device level ring natively, which means you can put them on the ring and not have to use a switch. That's a huge cost savings. So um, it allows you to create resilient networks without spending a lot of money and putting a lot of expensive hardware down there. Now, um, it does allow only for a single point of failure, but it does give us the fastest healing time compare, as compared to rep rings or uh, R, uh, RSTP or MRP. This will give us, uh, as long as there's, there are rules to it, there's, we're, only, we're limited to 50 nodes on the network, but when we have our 50 nodes on the network, we will guarantee you th three uh, millisecond heal times, not even a blip in the network. So that's why we like to use this. It's fast, it's simple, and it's not expensive. You don't have to use a lot of hardware. And it also makes it, by doing that, it's, it's one of the simpler networks set up because there are no switches to configure.
Now we did get a call earlier. Um, uh, I think, uh, or a question earlier, how does DLR differ from, I, it was 8032, which I think that's triple E I 30. I-8032, which covers, I think, general standards for rings in general. Um, I can't tell you exactly how it compares to it, but DLR is a specific protocol. It is not a Rockwell proprietary, proprietary protocol. Rockwell did develop, but, but they also gave it to the Open Device Vendors Association, ODVA. So everyone has access to DLR. Um, it does use, the, it doesn't use any pro proprietary hardware per se. Uh, you're, you can still, for the most part, use your same cable. Um, the, if the switches would have to be able to support DLR, um, but b there are options besides Rockwell for DLR type switches. It's not a protocol that ro only Rockwell has, but there are other vendors that support it too. So it is an open protocol, but also with DLR, because Rockwell helped develop it, we do have all the trouble uh, troubleshooting and diagnostic aids already built into the network, including all the HMI faceplates. Uh, we have a tag structure built for monitoring it. So it, it's, a, it's a very good way to get information about your control network. All right. Um, we're taking a DLR overview. Um, basically, we every device that's connected directly to the ring would be considered a node. We must have one supervisor on it. We can also have a backup supervisor on it. Um, the, the supervisor actually uh, handles the management of the system. And um, the biggest takeaway from this is we're going to be limited to 50 per, uh, nodes on the network. If you exceed the 50, we need to break off to another network. It's not that the network will crash, but uh, once you get past 50 nodes on the network, we can't, um, we can't uh, guarantee the, um, the heal time, the three millisecond heal time. All right, Wayne. Guess with that, we'll go to parallel redundancy protocol and that's me. Brian will be taking over. Thanks. Yep. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, this is Brian with the Reynolds Company. Um, so for PRP, um, often referred to as PRP, it's parallel redundancy protocol. It's a independent. Uh, it's independent of the application protocol, and can be used by most other industrial Ethernet protocols uh, within the individual LAN A, LAN B side. Uh, so pretty much anything within IEC's uh, 61784, um, meaning that it's just agnostic to that type of traffic uh, being transmitted and is invisible to the application itself. Um, it's defined within IEC 62439-3. Uh, and it's also has been adopted into the power networking side. Uh, so for those of you that deal with a lot of MCCs with the IEC 61850, um, PRP does provide a seamless failover. So there's no switchover time, no convergence time, uh, because the same packet itself is duplicated over separate paths. So in this picture, it's lane A and lane B are your separate paths. Um, it also has the benefit of having zero data loss if something were to fail along the path um, because of that duplication. Um, the first pa packet past the post wins uh, is I guess how I often refer to it. So the other, the late packet is essentially just thrown out or voted out uh, when both are received by the end device because it already has the valid packet. Um, when you look, when you need the most robust network possible for your industrial network, you're likely going to be talking about PRP today. Um, while it doesn't necessarily protect against the end device failing because when the end device fails, it fails, 
uh, every path in the network is duplicated um, and it is the most robust um, regarding switches and media. All right, go ahead, Wayne. So there's some verbiage to know about PRP and uh, we'll go ahead and start with the, the top of the stack here shown in the picture with Dan. So Dan stands for du double attached node um, sometimes people refer to it as a duly attached node, and essentially it just it's something that's PRP aware that connects both LAN A and LAN B. Uh, the SAN over on the right side with the panel view 5000 is a single attached node or singly attached node. Uh, these devices only reside on either LAN A or LAN B. Um, and if you have a singly attached node on lane A, it will not be able to see these singly attached node on lane B. Um, it's only visible to the duly attached nodes or red boxes within the PRP network. Um, the singly attached nodes are not PRP uh, aware um, because they're within those individual lands. Um, you would use uh, SAN for non-critical devices, like here we show an HMI terminal or maybe an industrial PC or thin clients um, along your, your industrial network. And then going down to the bottom left, we have a red box, which stands for redundancy box. And it typically will be a network switch that allows non-PRP capable devices of connecting both sides of the network LAN A and LAN B, and the end devices are classified as virtual DANs or, or VDANs, uh, so a virtual double attached node. Um, and it'll look as such uh, later within the uh, some of the network uh, tools that we have. Um, the infrastructure switches shown uh, for LAN A, LAN B, so the Stratix 5700s typically. Uh, for, for our normal um, designs are not PRP aware. They only know their own respective side of the network. And it's imperative that you don't connect these two together as uh, you'll cause communication errors uh, if you connect both lane A and lane B together uh, without a, uh, what is essentially a, a, either a red box or an actual PRP aware device between them. Um, and uh, within LAN A and LAN B itself, uh, all normal best practices apply regarding typical network designs for star configurations or DLR configurations like Mike mentioned earlier. Uh, go ahead, Wayne. So there are many, many possibilities uh, when it comes to implementing PRP in an industrial setting. You can have simplex or redundant controllers, regular or safety IO, IO with a single network module, IO with a redundant pair of network modules, um, and non-PRP capable devices connected through uh, Redbox. So in uh, this picture on the right, the uppermost stands um, are connected via HSRP or hot standby routing protocol, which is configurable within our layer three switches with the Stratix 5400, the 5410, um, or the the two catalog numbers that are layer three capable of the Stratix 5800. Um, it's not, I guess, take note, it's not currently possible to show this within Integrated Architecture Builder um, if you use that tool for your network layouts, um, but it is a tested configuration within the CPWE documentation that Wayne mentioned earlier. Um, the rest of the network downstream from those two uh, 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 DANs are uh, follow the PRP architecture that we discussed in previous slides with LAN A being represented in red, LAN B represented in, uh, with blue. And um, within the characterization uh, that has occurred within CPWE, uh, it has been tested with EIGRP which is the Enhanced Interior Gateway Routing Protocol. And it's a that's just a semi-proprietary Cisco routing protocol that helps determine the best route for data packets based on the distance uh, by de 
determining the number of hops uh, to the destination. Um, so basically, your shortest hop path is what it'll try to choose um, every, every time. Um, and it's network aware within its own network. Um, our Stratic sliding switches are Cisco based. And uh, with the C, uh, CPWE documents, uh, characterized with the uh, Cisco, Panduit, and Rockwell uh, working collaboratively to uh, to create those. Uh, pretty much any, typically anything with, um, that you can do with your Cisco IE switches are gonna be possible for the most part with the Stratic switches. There are a few exceptions. If you know your, um, CLI really well on the Cisco side. Um, the Stratic switches also have CLI enabled, so you can um, uh, essentially uh, use the same commands within those. There, There is a subset of commands that are available, not all of them, um, but for the most part, they're all there. Uh, reference architecture and SIP security. Um, SIP security is a ODBA standard, and it's available within the PRP network for our control logics devices with the use of the 1756-EN4-TR and uh, the not listed here's 1783-CSP SIP security proxy, um, which allows for SIP security to be used for end devices that don't support it natively. It looks, it's in the same form factor as our 1783-ETAPs, uh, if you've ever seen those. So it's a, essentially a little small switch um, that allows you to enable SIP security on devices that don't support it natively. So older, older devices that you may have. Um, so it's a good for a stopgap uh, if you're upgrading your system uh, with older devices on the network. Um, the goal of SIP security is to enable SIP connected devices to protect themselves from malicious SIP communications. Um, it can do this by rejecting the data that's been altered. Uh, rejecting messages sent by untrusted persons or devices, and rejecting messages that request actions that are not allowed. Um, more recently, uh, SIP security has been enabled with the latest firmware revision for the 1756-EN4-TR, um, and uh, also has the ability now to reside in a redundant pair of chassis with the uh, Control Logics L8 controllers or the 55, uh, 5580 controllers. Um, you can also, as of the previous firmware version, uh, which released, I think, this time last year, maybe a little uh, earlier than that, um, use the EN4TRs as a redundant adapter pair in your remote I.O. racks. Um, it's a nice feature for those that are worried about a single point of failure for the comms modules on a um, Control Logics REC, or Remote I.O. REC. Um, and uh, typically, you'll want to try to maximize this depending on your um, uh, layouts. So you're likely going to see these with uh, 710, 13, and 17 uh, uh, controller racks or chassis. Um, over time, uh, as more and more Rockwell devices release, uh, they sh would have SIP security capabilities. I believe the Kinetics, uh, some of the newer Kinetics also have the capability. Um, and just to mention, while the we're talking about PRP, the 1756EN2TP is PRP capable. It's not SIP security capable. If you need SIP security, you will need to go with the EN4TR. Uh, go ahead, Wayne. So, PRP configuration guidance can be found within the CPWE PRP guide, uh, which should still be EN, or the document number should be ENET-TD021, uh, and the PRP application technique guide, which should still be ENET-AT006. Um, within uh, the Rockwell uh, literature library, um, you can find all the CPWE documents um, typically your, your TD is going to be technical documentation and anything with AT is going to be your application techniques. Um, there's a 
few common steps to take for various switches within your PRP architecture. And the bookmark diagram on the right is taken from the application technique document. Um, as we saw before, if you're going to an enterprise network or DMZ, you can use HSRP for two layer three red boxes. Typically, it's going to be your Stratix 5400, 5410, or your 5800 layer three switches um, for a redundant connection outside your industrial network. Um, for the infrastructure switches, so the ones that are PRP unaware in the middle, um, they'll typically be the Stratix 5700 or 5800, uh, or the upcoming Stratix 5200 that Wayne mentioned. Um, it's a good idea to set the precision time protocol or PTP uh, or uh, SIP sync in order to ensure that all the switches that are PRP unaware are synchronized to the most accurate time possible. Um, on switch downlink ports, you can also enable the port fast feature for spanning true protocol or STP to improve the uh, recovery time uh, within their own respective uh, sides. Um, as a best practice, any of the infrastructure switches should be managed for the ability to access network diagnostics and advanced, more advanced configuration. Um, any infrastructure switch also needs to be able to support the maximum transmis transmission unit or MTU of uh, 1,506 bytes or greater. So there's also uh, add-on profiles for both Stratix and PRP-enabled modules. Um, so here is shown uh, on the top right, it's shown a uh, 5400 switch and the the other image below it is a 1756EN2TP module. Um, these add-on profiles make it easier to help diagnose potential issues within your PRP network, uh, help drill down to those areas that need maintenance. Um, and all the AOPs are free to download, free to have, um, and can be found at the Rockwell Product Compatibility and Download Center, often referred to as PCDC. Uh, you can use your favorite search engine to just search Rockwell PCDC, um, or you can go to compatibility.rockwellautomation.com and search for uh, whatever module or switch you have uh, to grab those AOPs that uh, you need. And there's a, a adding on to uh, the AOPs, there is also AOIs available uh, within our network device library. Um, so the network device library is our device object library for our Stratix line of lightly managed and fully managed switches, as well as our device level ring topologies. Uh, using these add-on instructions or AOIs and pre-configured graphical face plates with your Rockwell HMI platform of choice, you can help your operators, technicians, engineers more easily diagnose any potential issues with your network and even audit the network digitally, uh, reducing the amount of cabinets that you may need to go through to, to investigate those network paths. Um, and I believe with that, I believe that's the end of our presentation. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the, in the question window or the chat. And that's all I have. Oh, Brian, um, for Jack's question about OSPF and BGP, um, the 5400 I know will support OSPF. Um, I haven't I haven't found the protocol yet um, if it supports uh, IBGP yet, but I'll I'll keep looking for it. But that's typically um, something you wouldn't see in our, our typical layer two switches. Usually, it's the more advanced switches where those would reside. But um, Jack, I'll try to get an answer for you um, for both of those. And I had up here, I'll, you know, the uh, these are the the design imp implementation guys or the digs we've been talking about. So this is the uh, the Rockwell site, and uh, so this is simple by searching, um, you know, searching Rockwell uh, CPWE, and you can land on this industrial networks page. And uh, here's a list of of the digs that are available. The other thing I had, uh, I forgot I had bookmarked a long time ago is uh, Cisco and Rockwell had a little CPWE, um, kind of little virtual demo uh, page. We can make this link available as well. Um, 
but you can uh, go in and kind of click around and and see some of the benefits of the converged plant wide Ethernet. Um, and you know, here's your problem, and then here's your um, you know, here's how when you implement it, the benefits from it. So, uh, cool little virtual demo. We can uh, share this as well. Okay, and um, just Wayne, I, I do have an answer. BGP or Border Gateway Protocol and um, the Open uh, Shortest Path First Protocol are supported in the uh, Layer Three Fifty Four Hundreds. They tried to stump us, but uh, Mike, you were able to get through it. Yeah, I, I can search a manual as good well as anybody. 